Hello, everybody, and welcome to another excellent evening of Windfall. We have a couple of fantastic authors today, and I'm very excited for Joan of the Lane Literary Guild to introduce them to you. Uh, before we start, just a couple quick things. First, my name is Wendy, and I work here at the library, and I can see the um, Windfall reading series, which is always a delight. We are streaming, so welcome to those of you who are hearing us live. Um, and they will live for a little while on our YouTube page, so you're welcome to watch them later if you'd like. Um, please silence your cell phone so we don't interrupt the authors as they read. I would have to remind myself to do that. Um, it's very jarring to have a jaunty reading tone in the middle of an important poem or a piece of work. Um, also, a few thank yous. I want to thank both the uh, friends of the Eugene Public Library and the Eugene Public Library Foundation, both groups very tirelessly and selflessly uh, volunteer, raise money for us, help us buy books and materials. It's just fantastic. Without them, we wouldn't have this program. We wouldn't have all sorts of nifty things that the library is able to offer to the community. So thank you so much to both of those important groups. Thank you also, of course, to the Lane Literary Guild, um, wonderful folks, and they have been our partner in the Windfall reading series for a number of years. So thanks to all of them. Um, and I think that's about it. I'd now like to introduce Joan with the Lane Literary Guild to introduce our authors and have a great evening, everyone. Anyway, I'm so glad you're all here and it's really always exciting. So, our first reader today is Janet C. Ruger, who is a counselor and educator. Her poems have appeared in San Pedro River Review, Third Wednesday, The Timberline Review, Red River Review, Cirque, and Glass, a journal of poetry, among others, among other things she's published in. Nominated for the Pushcart Prize and widely anthology, Giant. In 2018, she was finalist for the Blue Light Press Book Award. Janice is the author of Transcending Damnation Creek Trail, um, Flooding Press 2010, 10 Coyote, Blue Light Press 2018, Crossing the Burnside Bridge, and other poems, Sear Press 2023. So, welcome, Janice. Thanks, Joan. Great to see everybody. And I uh, want to thank the, I think it's the Emerald Literary Guild now. This change, uh, they just transformed into the Emerald Literary Guild and the Eugene Public Library. And thank you all for coming, uh, especially on uh, National Poetry Month, April. So I'm going to, I'm going to begin with a poem about my dad and um, it's about the Yukon Territory, called Yellow Night. Yellow Night. As a young man, my father mined gold in Yellow Knife. He described yellow flakes layered in black rock, told stories about the Wildcat Cafe. First opened in 1937, miners found women and whiskey at the Gold Nugget Bar. Some men never left, worked in the mine all week, lost at cards, unlucky in life and games of chance. Yellow Knife, named for the Yellow Knife Indians, the Copper Indians. Near the Arctic coast, the Yellow Knife Indians traded tools made from copper deposits. Deep mountains in the Yukon Territory, filled with vast rivers, Grizzly bears and wolves wander through forests of spruce and birch. The landscape scoured by wind, rolling areas of bare stone, gray rock among patches of lichen. My father talked about endless lakes, the big lake, the great slave lake, surrounded by several small lakes. The high latitude of Yellowknife 
caused variations between night and day. 20 hours of darkness in December, twilight lasted all night in June. He saved his weekly pay, collected gold dust in a small aspirin bottle. His bunkmate was a member <laughs> of the Yellowknife tribe. They became good friends, didn't talk much, but trusted each other when mining deep below the earth. Twenty twenty was the celebration of a hundred years since the nineteenth amendment passed. And uh, so this poem is called Suffragettes March for Justice. A March morning cold and crisp on the third day in 1913, women gather in the early hours before the flaming orange sun rises in the distance over the foggy DC city skyline. Katie Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul arrive. Inez Mulholland rides atop a white horse, leading 5,000 suffragettes down Pennsylvania Avenue. They wear white, purple and green sashes, white for purity, purple for loyalty and dignity, green for hope. History has called them to stand and march, to raise their voices for the right to vote. The clip-clop of horses' hooves during the early morning gathering, heard in the narrow streets, echoes like a clarion call. Suffragettes left their children sleeping in beds their husbands sipping coffee at kitchen tables. Suffragettes knew justice did not unfold easily. It had to be pursued, forged like a fine silver sword, plunged into fire, held under icy cold water, hammered repeatedly, each flaw pounded out of the sterling metal. Their lives had been forged in the heat of protest, marches, and speeches frozen in the bitter cold during times of loneliness, jail cells, and exclusion. They knew deep in their souls that justice was worth the fight for women and all Americans to vote in the country they loved. The 19th Amendment embodied the right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When, um, when I was a kid, I would go with my dad a lot to uh, Powell's Bookstore. And we lived in Portland on a Saturday. And at that time, Powell's was just a very small place. It wasn't the multi-block complex that it is today. But this, this poem is about Powell's. Powell's Bookstore. While perusing the poetry section at Powell's, suddenly blaring from the loudspeaker, attention, Larry Lederman, please come to the blue room to be reunited with your wife. I imagine Larry Lederman picking up a book on happiness by the Dalai Lama or a copy of the spiritual writings of Rumi. I envision Larry Lederman leaning against a bookshelf, wandering through aisles and aisles of books to the biographies. I see Larry Lederman immersed in flipping through the early life of Calvin Coolidge, one of our most laconic presidents, or perhaps skimming a volume of Auden's life and poetry. Does Larry Lederman want to be reunited with his wife? <laughs> Maybe he's joyfully reading Young's dreams in the Rose Room, or having a cup of coffee and a scone in the cafe with a copy of D.H. Lawrence. Perhaps he's picked up The Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles or imagines himself sailing across Jean Reed's wide Sargasso Sea. <laughs> the next poem is a, um, it's a high bun, and some of you may be familiar with this form. It's a, a Japanese form, and it, um, it's a begins with a prose section, and then um, it's complemented by a haiku at the end. And uh, people would go on spiritual journeys and trips, and they would document their trip, which was usually about nature, and then they would, uh, you know, 
write this down in a journal and end with a haiku poem at the end. The Old Masonic Cemetery. I forged my way from the bottom of the hill, past overgrown ferns, green weeds, yellow dandelions, and puffs. The worn gravestones scattered lonely on the side of the path. A hot day in July, stop on the trail, drink deeply from my water bottle. The city founders buried here. On the other side of the hill, on the downward slope, the mausoleum stands, built of solid white stone, an Egyptian motif. A pharaoh and a winged dog guard the arch doorway. Steel bars prevent anyone from leaving or entering. Honey bee flies past, close to my ear, glad buzzing, wildflowers blooming. The next poem is uh, Crossing the Burnside Bridge, which is the uh, title of my book, uh, which was published by Cirque Press. And so I'm very uh, grateful to Cirque for publishing my book. And um, I grew up in Portland, so I, I left and came down here to go to school. Beautiful, like a lot of people in my 20s. Crossing the Burnside Bridge. Remember how I used to talk about Portland, about walking over the Burnside Bridge, the Willamette River swirling far below, sailboats, tugboats, vying for position on the river, the 1920 bridge architecture, two turrets, a watchman surveying the river for the great ships, walking into Old Town, white stag sign hovering over it all. Today we cross the bridge, walk for justice. When we were kids, we picked strawberries, raspberries, in fields just south outside of Portland, earned enough to buy school clothes in the fall. Burnside on the other side of the bridge was known as Skid Row. Our berry bus, a rusty yellow school bus, stopped to pick up the winos from Burnside. They picked berries alongside us. Their toque bottles lined the rows of strawberry fields. Pendleton Mill store windows, displayed blue collar work clothes, heavy plaid shirts, red and yellow wool blankets adorned with teepees, solid leather work boots, all beckoned the day laborer. We walked west past St. Andre's Catholic Mission, past the dimly lit bars, dark dives, pink neon signs, Mary's Strip Club, the Paris Theater, hardcore porn shown all night long. We walked to Chinatown to hung far loads, known for the best chop suey and Mai Tais, to pass the jazz diopas, beanbag chairs, strong cheap drinks, primo jazz club, past the Powell's bookstore, titles in the window, a portrait of the artist as a young man, Our Lady of Flowers by Genet. A walk further up to Washington Park, a statue of Sacagawea, pointed the way to the Lewis and Clark Trail. Now we cross the Burnside Bridge. We protest in the pulsing heat of 2020. Vibrant stars clamor, sway about the moon. To the east, seven mountain peaks cluster around Mount Hood. This burning August, we march for justice. We write, we sing, we dance, we claim the summer. It echoes over the Burnside Bridge, through the streets and buildings of the Holy Night. So, uh, the next poem is about uh, fishing. I didn't grow up fishing. I think if, you, if your parents fished, then you did. You learned to fish. But <laughs> I had a friend that uh, liked to fish, and so this was the, the first time that I went fishing with her. And the thing about, uh, point about herring is you have a line and then you have six hooks on it. And um, so, you know, when I pulled up the line, there were six fish, one on each hook. So I was thrilled. I thought this was a really great thing and uh, for a while. <laughs> Fishing for herring. That brilliant crisp morning, 
The sun rays skipped persuasively over the sleeping pier. Six sharp hooks on each rig snag on just about anything they touch. The blue undersea, the herring share, engages the blinding light. Six herring appear, one on each hook. With a sudden exposure to open air, revealed and naked, they wriggle wildly silver. Working the jigging line, not too high or hard, just a slight movement, just a desire. I was fortunate to uh, teach an intro to poetry writing class just across the street here at LCC through continuing ed for five years. So this poem is about that experience. I think a couple of my students are here, so this better be good. <laughs> poetry writing 101. In my teaching years, I prepared Thursday nights for my 6 to 8 p.m. class. Traffic picked up in the streets, often stuck idling at the railroad tracks, waiting for the train to pass. Rain, clear sky as I approached the classroom. Expectant students, eager, waiting. We began by sharing poems from, poems they, from poets they especially like who inspire them. Passions rise, the written word, promises, awakenings, mysteries. Intelligence, curiosity in their wild eyes, they expect wise words. I turn the discussion back to each student. The class unfolds, discourse begins. Students, young at 20, one student in her 80s, a few teachers have signed up who want to learn to teach poetry. We study the villanelles of Dylan Thomas, the images of William Carlos Williams, the metaphors of Sylvia Plath. I entreat them to travel to the country of poetry, explore its rolling rivers, rocky deserts. They take a poem, ravish it like a hungry lover. At the Hong Kong restaurant after class, I sit alone at back table where I'm able to see the entire dining room. I order a cold glass of Chablis, a steaming plate of chicken chow yuck, hot oil on the side. The egg rolls with plum sauce arrive. While I wait for the main dish, I realize loss is a hallmark of identity. We don't have to reclaim everything. So a bit of a turn at the end there. That poem always makes me hungry for Chinese food. <laughs> So this is, um, this is called Before the Wildfires. She wrote the phone number hastily on the palm of her hand, rode home hard and fast on her lucky bike. The number partially disappeared with the hot sweat of her palm. She dashed into the house, copied the number on a grocery receipt, Wind began to bang against the house, a warning the trees and power lines could be down in the coming days. Her lights flickered, the living room lost electricity. Under the last low light, she looked at the number again. She wanted to think about the phone number alone in the dark. Well, um, it's um, it's a in response to another poet's poem. William William Carlos Williams wrote uh, "Dance Ruse," and so it's you know it's interesting to respond to another poet. You're uh, you you kind of having a dialogue with another poet, whether they're still on the planet or not. So it's fun to do. Embracing the Northern Light after "Dance Ruse" by William Carlos Williams. The neighborhood is slumbering. The moon, a dazzling white crescent, floats brazenly above empty lots, woods, and fields in the small hours of morning. Overhead, 
flashing stars streak, lighting up shadows of sober Douglas firs. These trees were confidence and friends of my youth. From my simple rooms, I rise early and begin to chant the sutra. Chanting alone, I face east, look at my strong hands and tan arms. Sing quietly, I am not afraid, I am not afraid. I will stand firm at one with myself. Against the rose-crested dawn of this Milky Way morning, light seeps through the window blinds. I continue to chant and sing, the truly the hearty optimist in this clabbered house. Um, I've been fascinated by, by trains and railroad stations you know, for a while, and so the next two poems are about trains, starting with um, Portland Rail Yard. Portland Rail Yard, the line bitter wind buffets the young traveler as he hops over the rusty rims of the railroad track. Cobwebs in the freight car shimmer like constellations surging in the noir night, bandied about by gusts and breezes. The next morning, a flaming sun springs along the horizon, reflecting on yellow fields and more green fields beyond red clay woven into the hard railroad ground. Houses, signposts, roads flash by swiftly like images in a film clip. A flock of blackbirds rest in a copse near a thicket of small tree shoots. The traveler grabs his knapsack, jumps off the freight train, rolls into a lush maze of corn, chasing a dream. Fields throw off tender light. This poem is called uh, Break Train to Jean to Portland. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I convinced my girlfriend to hop a freight train with me. <laughs> and uh, of course, in your 20s, you don't think about you know, all of the repercussions of what you do, but uh, we. Uh, the train stopped in Corvallis and the engineer got off and he walked all the way back to where we were. And the first thing he said was, do you girls travel this way often? And, uh, we were very quiet, very quiet, but he proceeded to tell us all the horrors, all the horrible things that could happen. Um, you know, I think he, he must have, had, uh, he was, you know, I think of him fondly now over the, all these years because he didn't throw us off the train, but um, he said the load could shift, we'd be, we'd be crushed, uh, the door would slam shut, <laughs> we'd never be found, um, or <laughs> there were escapees from the state penitentiary riding the rails. <laughs> so with all of that, you know, that we never did this again, but... <laughs> But it was, it was quite an adventure. <laughs> Great train, Eugene to Portland. It occurred to me during the fall of 1982, riding a freight train from Eugene to Portland with my girlfriend Kate, that anyone who was an English major at an American university had read On the Road by Jack Kerouac. We hide between two shabby freight cars, graffiti covering the doors, wait for our chance. The railroad engineer has just passed on his rounds. We climb the thin metal rungs of the train ladder, jump into the freight car, huddle together as the wagon lurches and jerks forward north toward Portland. In the afternoon, red and orange leaves blow across the silver-plated tracks. The scent of autumn smoke lingers in the brisk air. Sun beams down from the powder blue sky. We hear the steady rhythm of railroad cars clicking over the tracks. Okay, so um, 
I have two more poems. The first one is called uh, France, France in September. That autumn, I lived at L'Hôtel de la Petite Fleur in the old part of Nice, La Vieille Ville. The room four flights up, a narrow winding staircase built during the Inquisition, the walls a light brown Italian plaster. I walk through the ancient streets to the sun-crested blue promenade, past a noisy market. Medieval Gothic church spires, stained glass, faces of saints, expressions of ecstasy. Pigeons congregated on the marble steps in sets of three, siblings celebrating a happy reunion, exchanging the family news. I met with friends in cafes, drank red wine through the afternoon, talked of plans to travel, Greece in October, Spain in the spring. I understood the French way of life, the passion of love and food, the intuitive voices echoing within. And I'll end with um, Three Finger Jack. The day we hiked Three Fingered Jack, I was 20, you were 18. The slopes beneath the rocky base wind burned. The trail rose steeply to an open moraine, then to a lofty point. We reached the ridge top, the alpine range, in the distance, the three sisters. Above Jack's summit, we rested on the soaring rocky incline. Bare grass grew below, tall feathers sprang from an indigo lake. Sheets of lava, igneous rock in our way, the crest of crags surrounded an abraded cone, an uneven volcano, crimson with ebony bands. When the sun moved below the horizon, we were still high above on the trail. Our breath and words appeared like clouds. Snow rested on ground cover. The trail twisted and turned. Chilled with fear, we peered into Jack's flinty face. Along the narrow path, we inched our way through semi-darkness to the meadow below. The year's low snowpack had moved the peak bloom forward. With joy, we gazed at the meadow. Huckleberry, vanilla leaf, snowbrush, and salmonberry bloomed early. Thank you. That was a fairly beautiful reading. Thank you, Janice. Um, before we continue, I'm going to ask you to take a five minute break, eat some snacks, buy a book for them, maybe. And I'm going to try and find out how to turn my phone off. <laughs> I was saying very many uh, silent prayers during this wonderful reading. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, my wonderful audience. A missing boat was found, like we will be fixed. Um, the phone is turned off. It's time to read some more, to listen some more. So come back to your seat if you will. There'll be another break at the end. This was just an accidental emergency break because I was so nervous the whole reading that something terrible would happen. You know, that the phone would start ringing and screaming its name. And stuff. So, um, prepare yourself for another wonderful read here. And our next reader, uh oh, wait till Raj is on the phone. So, okay. Okay, everyone's ready now. Sit down. Relax. Open your ears. So, our next reader will be John Van Briel. Now, John uses his creative vision and accessible writing style to explore both the darker and the quirkier sides of human behavior. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including his recently published book, Glass to Sand. He is also the author of three books on violence prevention, an award-winning artist with work featured in collections throughout the Pacific Northwest, and a musician with lyrics and songs published on two LPs. He resided in Salem, Oregon, he resides now in Salem, Oregon, where he laments the loss of smoke-filled taverns 
and the disappearance of free downtown parking. <laughs> Welcome, Johnny. Well, it is lovely to be here. Thank you for having me and the Literary Guild and Eugene Library for this opportunity. Um, and Janice, it's awesome to read with you. This is a uh, quite an honor for me. You all received handouts, and the reason for that is that I'm going to read in sequence, uh, but you can also read along yourself, and then I personally, when I read poetry, I have to, I like the form of it just to look at it as well, so uh, I try to hand these out. Uh, I do want them back, though, and I will not be able to get to all the poems. Most of them are in the book that I brought, uh, which is on sale for $10 for one, two for $15. It's a spring special, right over there. Um, and I'll, I'll get through maybe the first 10 or 12 of the poems uh, within my 25 minute time slot. The poems um, are in large part about nostalgia, longing, love. Uh, there's some erotica in there. <laughs> there is uh, uh, clearly an indulgence in vice. The way the book is set up is there's some outward leaning poems in the first section. The middle section is uh, basically titled bar poems. So they were written in bars, uh, usually fairly divey bars, places I find inspiration. And the last section is the inward leaning section, which is a little more uh, uh, lyric poetry, a little more like essay. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get moving on those. And I'll explain a little bit uh, as, I, um, as I go through a little bit about each poem. So this first one is not in the book, and it took place in a coffee shop, which is also a pub. Uh, some of you, if you've been to Salem, it's called the Governor's Cup, a fairly well-known coffee shop, also uh, has some of the finest musicians in the Northwest to play there on the weekends. Uh, and this poem is called Distracted. Uh, there's a clear theme about failed relationships and kind of uh, insightful moments, but mostly just being completely distracted by what's around me instead of writing, which is what I was supposed to be doing. Distracted. At the cup, sipping a breve down to the phone. At the laptop, returning an email to a friend who is struggling in a failing relationship. My note weighted by telling reflections of my own botched companies causes me discomfort. So I turn to the shop's interior for a change of texture and focus. My search finds my image mirrored in the stainless casing of the espresso machine. Behind it, a lanky, elegant barista piloting the valves, knobs, levers, and caps. She glances. My way in smiles. I quickly, awkwardly look away. Outside through the lobby window, I see a raven-haired, olive-toned woman with body exaggerating from hip hugger jeans, her warm skin is decorated with a variety of attacks. Three are colorful monikers to her heritage. Ixtaba in deep blue and purple. Chicana in green and red. Viva Miraza in green and gray. She snaps at a Zippo, lights a hand rolled cigarette, settles in at the sidewalk table. My thoughts return to the interior when the barista sign spins up a new playlist and bumps the volume, popping the speakers with Jamie Cullen's sorrowful cover of Lover, You Should Have Come Over. The notion of failed romance returns my musing to the woman smoking shag outside, now joined by a young man in full dress, which is a hint of ink flowing from under his collar. They appear connected familiar, intimate. She affects a slow French inhale, puffing the smoke in his face while shifting her seat to his lap. He gulps at the air, attempting to capture the remnants of her breath. Then with four extended fingers, he swipes down her lower spine, imitating a credit card charge. She fidgets as if tickled and glances back into the window, a reflex to see if their provocative moves were witnessed. She catches my study and beams a smirk, then nods. My optimism refreshed, I return to the email and consider infusing a fragment 
hope into my poorest box. This so next piece is titled Maslow's Leapfrog. I, uh, I won't explain this piece because I think it explains itself really well. Maslow's Leapfrog. These times of fires, feuds, plagues, and floods, more intense than in the past? Probably not. It was worse for my ancestors. They knew calamity as Hydra. Still, in the context of our times, infectious disruption tows chaos in its wake, while the politics of acrimony shoves civility to the outer fence, pressing its back to thin, rusty wire and slicing barbs. We watch the misfortune of others repeat and reside on our screens, sidewalks, and vacant lots. Trauma is an abstract experienced subjectively. Try as we always do, this game of leapfrog on Maslow's stairs often ends with limbs splayed wide and yanked back by body's heavy burden, fingers left to grasp at lower trips. One that's a little more lighthearted, Theo and Sweet Bee, this really happened. Uh, it's quite scandalous. Uh, I did take a little bit of poetic license on it, but um, it's occurred at a uh, open mic uh, uh, for bands at a uh, at a very divey tavern. Theo and Sweepy, open mic at the Triangle Inn, several beers deep, and I'm in good company. Low light and the smell of musty beer-stained carpet mixed with bar racks soaked in Mr. Clean Summer Citrus Sanitizer entice my mood to feelings of seamy amusement. Watching the musicians as they watch each other, some eager, some nervous, a few affecting indifference. To the left of the slots, close enough for the assortment of screen lights to tint his pale middle-aged skin, Theo sits with his lady. He's a regular, she's not. They speak to each other with side glances and slightly tilted, slightly turned heads. Her face holds a curious but unimpressed expression as she takes in the texture and sights within her boyfriend's lair. They watch the performers. Theo also eyes the door. The music starts. I know the band members from another world, five age men, professionals stuck in years of public service, at peace with the limitations of their talent. They begin with a cover. Uh, with a parliament cover, folk stop talking and sing along. Make my funk the P funk. I want to get it funked up. Sweet B enters the side door, carrying her guitar case, covered it covered in stickers that announce her allegiance to rock bands, music venues, and foreign travel. Steps past me, sits at the back of the bar, hoists the gear onto the adjacent stool. She has attended these open mics for months, but it's never unsnapped the case or stood to play. Theo's lady touches his hand, smiles, and leaves with purse in hand. Theo inhales deeply, juts his jaw forward, revealing his lower teeth. B moves to Theo's table. They whisper. Their expression suggests that they have something in common. Relatives, old friends, maybe colleagues. Next band up, four women with pantomimed articulation. Their lyric highlights a sexual encounter with two Portuguese marathon runners. Theo stands and stretches, sets a 20 on the table, drifts out the door. Sweet B pays her tab, lifts her guitar case, saunters to the door, and steps through, surveying the parking lot. Dimly lit by pale yellow mercury vapor of antiquated lamps, she focuses on something beyond my vision. I'm ready to move on as the band touches off a Dylan cover. It's bad form to leave during Tom Thumb's blues, but I do, slipping out a side exit. In the parking lot, I catch two silhouettes, B and Theo, in a car. There's fumbling. Then slow movement, fog windows. My assumption, well, you know, then again, it is cold and they could be smoking some boo. I'm puzzled. What does Bio have? 
What does B have in that guitar case? This particular poem called Bodacious um, is another bar poem. Uh, in this case, I was in a, a fairly bad mood. Uh, I was in uh, living in Idaho. Uh, my dog was uh, having cancer treatment from the university at school on uh, the Washington side of the border. My father-in-law had cancer. I had to stay in Moscow, Moscow, Idaho, Idaho for four weeks and um, right in the middle of COVID. So I was in a bit of a bad mood anyway uh, when I wrote this. It might, it might, uh, uh, it might be obvious. The poster reads Snake River Stampede. It features a kinetic image of a bulldog, his right elbow cinching a steer's horn, the arm extending until the hand is gripped over the animal's forehead. His left hand clamps the, le the left horn, his teeth clenched, and his legs jet forward, his boot heels grinding into the dirt. Have you been? I point. The bartender pauses, then glances at the placard. You're a few times. Another one of those? He points at my empty Corona extra. Frosty glass with salt on the rim would be great. Thanks. He delivers, and I give him my empty in trade. I look up steer wrestling. Then bull right. Wikipedia says that Bodacious was infamously known as the world's most dangerous bull because of his reputation for injuring and killing riders. He's dead now, but his, but his spirit lives on through his instruction and in, through his induction into the pro rodeo and the bull riding hall of fame. Reflections on wine glasses hang from a wire rack counterlevered to the back wall. Pick up the bodily, the boldly lit beer signs, oily faces, sequin denim, shiny belt buckles, and flannel shirts enclosing the bar. I squint to further refract the images, creating a sublime kaleidoscope vision, enhanced by the re relaxing effects of un montan de cerveza. The place is jovial, friendly, a sort of clear, a clear water mountain cool, but my attitude remains assertive. Cancer has visited my family, taking one life and threatening three more. No one wants to bulldog that ride or be invited to its Hall of Fame. Halloween, Halloween decorations hang from the ceiling and off the walls throughout the room, promoting the Day of the Dead. I'm already wearing my costume called Civility, and I encourage the spirits of the deceased to visit just for a few minutes. I want to speak with the bull and the bulldogger about that last ride. I grab my bottle and I head out to the smoker's porch where I bum a Paul Mall non-filter and a light. Avoiding talk, I suck the fume down deep into my lungs, then carefully tongue it out through my mouth in distinct puffed balls, snorting it back in through my nose, then exhale it again and repeat. A trick I learned years ago because it looked cool and made for a good party trick. Now I don't care how it looks. It has become an exercise that is soothing and distracting. I squint and look through the bottle at the porch party lights and the smokers. They appear entangled, swirling, ethereal. I can almost hear those spirits, and they are telling me that I'm strapping on for the ride. And that's pretty far from cool. Here's my uh, love poem to my wife. Uh, might have a touch of erotic to him. It's a touch. Uh, definitely inward leaning, a little lusty. Uh, this poem is titled Gravel Sweat You. Started out as pilgrims with our eyes frequently checking forward to the end of the trail, too far off to see a shoreside park at the edge of the river. Knowing the walk will be long and at times difficult, we look forward to the river the way a kid in the last month of school of the school year anticipates summer camp. Alone, we navigate these gravel edges overgrown with unruly blackberry bush and thick clumps of dry grass. Occasionally, we enjoy shadow provided by white oaks and black walnut trees that form clumpy canopies. The path is narrow and lost in the hillside. You stop and point up the hill, noting a pedestrian road filled with people strolling, biking, and running. At the road's edge, edges, benches, and pergolas provide rest and shade for the travelers. 
The road leads to the same river. The people are unaware of our path and us. I study you from your long hands to your longer feet, then on to your upper lip and brow, dripping with sweat and sunscreen. I reach out and gather a droplet on my middle finger, lapping it with my tongue. You laugh and call me a freak. Then raise your arm and expose your damp arm. You dare. How brave are you? <laughs> on that path alone and unnoticed, I showed you, finding your glow in two dozen surfaces, crevices, and wrinkles, and filing the memory of your palate to my mind. Spent, you high five me, and we attempt to wipe the dust from our bodies, but most of it has turned to muddy smears. You shrug and we move on. Our clothes hang loose and off center. We adjust the fit as we walk. The day turns to dusk and we both enter a spell fostered by the rhythm of gravel crunching below our feet. Our pace slows, our voice is quiet. You say the gravel is soothing, a soothing unexpected gift, crushed to be trod, rough but reassuring underfoot. As we walk, my mind plays reruns of the memories collected from the past. I, I, I take pause and consider what I would offer the gods of cognitive neurology to restore those thoughts to vibrant. But I've walked long enough to know that a faded memory often becomes a lost memory. What little we keep is our heaven or hell. I resolve to keep this debt. I focus on my step. The spell continues. I don't want the river or the gathering place. I have this, the gravel, the sweat, you. Between coffee and sunset. Um, this was inspired by a couple that I know um, that, is, that have lost a lot, endured a lot, and man, managed to maintain a relationship through some very trying times. Between coffee and sunset. Now, they don't have to talk, but they do sometimes. They grew apart in the 70s, feeling the call to renewal through their friend's example of divorce and single life that never separated. They found connection again during the 80s in their joint struggle to balance lucrative careers and ambitious parenting that pressed their children too firmly to excel. They skidded then slipped apart again in the late 90s after the loss of a son taken by morphine and vodka. In the early aughts, they swung back and forth between the depth of love that evolves from care and familiarity to the irritated resentment that sparks from the same. Now, they find each other in the silence that contains the familiar. Their history, their routines, and spaces between appetizers and meals, morning coffee and sunset gazing. They find each other in those sparse moments between planting and pruning, then hoeing and harvesting their shallow and tenuous roots. All right. Um, the next is tripped up, and uh, this one's informed by my guilt, uh, probably our collective guilt, and it um, it references uh, some music. And if we make it to one of my last poems, uh, at the end, if you can guess who all the musicians are, I'm hinting at you get bonus points. All right, this one will be fairly obvious to you. Tripped up. The modal jacks, a soothing sound in my earbuds. I navigate the determined roots of a white oak clawing their way through a sidewalk fracture and stumble and glimpse at the edge of the bridge, tucked just under the concrete steps leading to the park, a man resting, shrouded in blue plastic tarp. A garbage bag sits, spilling soiled socks, tattered underwear, a pair of truly distressed denims over the damp grass. A Starbucks paper cup stuffed with candy bar wrappers lies next to his hand. His sleeping bag is strewn over the stair railing, drying in the sun. A few feet away, a shopping cart adorned with strands of decayed ivy, wet rags, an orange safety cone, a dog leash, and silver tinsel leans against the bridge post. The tinsel doesn't make sense. My mind mutes the tune. 
its moderate melodic tempo transposing to the smell of dampness in urine. It reminds me of the high school locker room when I was 15. It's not a nostalgic smell. Compassion fatigue, I've become numb to these scenes, a new normal in my city. In the past, I was acutely concerned, each person living on the street advising me on guilt. There are threadbare accessories and refuse, a reminder of my failed humanity. I often felt compelled to do something, but secretly wished they would return to the trees out of sight. I know there must be a middle ground between passion and indifference. I head back to town, through the park, focused on the music. Miles reminds me that it's just blues. That's all it is. My thoughts turn to a book on Andrew Wyeth. My life has always been a painting composed collaboratively by the gods of biogenetics and my parents, but left for me to add, to add color, value, and form. Now my kids add glazes of translucent monochromatic tone, like thin colored slices of stained glass held over the entire canvas, each layer subtly unifying the whole. There is an awkward aesthetic, but so far it is working. It could have been different though, it could still be. I look back at the resting man, that's me in a different universe, that's any of us. All right, um, back to love and lust. Uh, act two, scene two, borrowed from the bard. Um, this is a, an early curtain call poem, uh, but there is another chapter uh, which you will have to think of yourself at the end of this poem. This is about voyeurism, love, hope, and again, a little bit of softcore erotica. Act two, scene two. We sat street side. The air was cooling, the day almost done. My Juliet ordered us another round, vodka and soda crisp with carbonation and muddled lime. Our conversation winding down, we enjoyed the ambient sounds of the city and browsed the rambling pedestrians. Across the street from the third floor balcony, a light switched on, shone into the evening. A woman appeared parting the drapes of the sliding door, enthusiastically stepping through to grip the terrace railing. She watched the night while lifting a vape pen to her lips. The spark of the activation light flashed. She slowly drew from its contents. Holding her breath, she smiled, turned toward the door and slumped against the balustrade. A young man approached, shirtless and head lowered, his eyes fixed on her. The two embraced and slowly slipped their lips together. She exhaled the vapor into his mouth. His torso swelled as it took the drug deep into his chest. Her arms rose to his shoulders. He pulled her toward the interior, both disappearing as the remnants of steam dissolved in the air behind them. We continued our watch, blushing, hoping they would return. But within seconds, the room's interior dim to a glow. Drapes caught a slight breeze and danced unhurriedly against the rigid sides of the door case. And I think I uh, have room for about one more. That about, okay. Let's, um, let's keep it light and uh, we'll do Twister. All right. We're going to jump ahead to uh, Twister. I'm in Spokane, 400 miles away from you. It's hot and I drift in and out of sleep. My dreams turn to half awake imaginings. This one sticks with me. We're new to our relationships and I risk writing a poem about you. You smile and ask, after you read me the poem, can we play that twist again? I sustain a sigh until my lungs, my lungs are empty. Follow it with a quick breath. It's just a draft. Remember that. You nod, I fully inhale into sight. Fingers interlocked in a fleshy zipper, ankles twined, she reclines. Eyelids cover cerulean pools as she blinks in slight exaggeration to express her point. All while she turns and tips her brow in my way, 
a quick stick. Sometimes a turned up corner of her otherwise tempered mouth, a grin, sometimes not always a slight blush. I pause adjusting the effect and drinking it in. I still the glance just to save it for later again. Leaning back, I cock my head to the side. I'm embarrassed, I question. Maybe a little sentimental. You stare, I can hear your deep breaths. You play you place your hand on you place your hand on your chest and rhetorically ask, too sentimental, my dear, it's perfect. And Johnny. You already had me in the bag. Now, well, I'm way in the bag. You shake your head to clear emotion or awkwardness or maybe pause the impending kiss. Break out the twister. I want to try. Right hand green, left foot red. I walk to the closet to dust off the goods and look back to catch you smelling each of your armpits in turn. You shrug and say something to yourself that I cannot hear. I return and display the mat on the floor. You slide the shoulders, dress off your sundress down slightly, restraining your arms, and slip your sandals off, kicking them to the side. Thank you. It's been wonderful being here. But there is more, and the more is a finding. But um, our beloved Erica, who couldn't be here tonight, has left us with questions to ask the readers. So um, the questions are always really exciting. So here we go. Did you both come back here? Yeah. Can you can you hear? Are you all here? Okay. I'll ask you first, Jen. Um, what is one thing you would give up to become a better writer? <laughs> Perfect answer. John? I, I, I think that is the right answer for me, too. I'm just trying to figure out slow it down. That's been my biggest issue. So, last so I'd probably have to give up uh, some of the other things that I do. <laughs> what are your favorite literary journals, Janice? Journals? Mm -hmm. I aspire to. Oh, why don't you come to the. Why don't you both come to your hands? Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to be able to. I'd like to get published in uh, Rattle. It's. Um, I really respect that journal and uh, Kenyon, Kenyon Review. But I like the Timberline Review. I have a poem that was published in, in that journal and uh, San Pedro Review. I mean, there's so many good journals out there. A lot. Cirque is one of my favorites. They published a book. And a copy that have uh, Corbell. So. Oh, right. Yes. So oh, I can just talk loud. <laughs> what was your favorite childhood book? I, I like the uh, the Outsiders by S. E. Hidden. It was about juvenile delinquents, and uh, you know I aspired to be one, but <laughs> I wasn't brave enough to do that. But I like to read about them. Uh. I was probably a character in that book. Uh, I uh, the most probably inspiring book I read as a kid, which turned me into a reader, was uh, James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Kids. What is the most difficult part of your artistic life? Well, most um, most poems take a lot of writing and rewriting and re-envisioning. So, you know, you, you get the, some of the impressions down on paper, and then it's, it's like sculpting. You remove certain words and then you add others. And so it, it, takes, it takes a while. Um, I really enjoy it once I get into it, but I think that's the most challenging part is just the rewriting. 
uh, definitely the subtraction because I don't want to give up some of those beautiful words that I know shouldn't be there, right? <laughs> so uh, it's it's giving in to that process to admit to yourself that <laughs> this phrase is not needed. But I do save it on another piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give it. It's not going to be a problem. Dennis, would your family support your career? Yes, yes, I do. Um, my parents are gone now, but uh, I have um, two nieces and a nephew, and uh, I have great, great nephews and nieces, and my my two sisters. I'm the oldest of three sisters, so both my sisters are very supportive of my work. And I read in Portland a couple times, and everybody shows up, so it's fun to see family in the in the audience. Yes, no, I, I was fortunate enough to have four great parents, not just two, and they were all very supportive, but very different. Um, my father is an artist, uh, my stepmother is a writer, my mother is, was a counselor, and my stepdad was an administrator in, at Cal State Bakersfield, very business-minded. So they all approached uh, me from different perspectives, uh, from my father saying, hey, just do whatever you want. My mom's saying, have a backup plan. And my stepdad's saying, how much money are you going to make? Just show me you're going to make some money. But I did this long time. If you had to do something different as a child or teenager to become a better person, what would you do? If I had to do something different as a child or an adult, for a child or a teenager. Oh, okay. To make you better. Okay. I think I would have signed up for um, journalism in high school. I mean, there was a, you know, we, we had the, the um, high school newspaper. And I thought about it, but I, I didn't do it. And I would have taken a typing class. I avoided that because I, I didn't want to become a secretary. Um, <laughs> so typing and taking a journalism class in high school. Well, I would have taken more writing classes for sure because I didn't do that until I was in college. I just took what I had to in high school so I could get out of there as quickly as possible. I also uh, would have learned music when I was a kid. And I, I played the piano for about three years from the time I was kindergarten to the third grade. I quit um, and I took it back up in my late 40s and what I found is that I'm not a good musician by the way <laughs> I play with the best musicians and they just tolerate me uh, but I found that that music um, um, kind of cross pollinates with the writing and the painting that I do uh, and so the interesting thing about all this is that when I do one thing like if I write, if I write in the morning, or I play music in the morning, and then I write it, then I paint. Everything I do takes less time to get a reasonably good product because that part of the brain is already moving. And um, uh, I think people should be focused on one thing if they can't get really, really good. At it. But adding more creative endeavors, and, and I certainly, um, um, I played football for two weeks. And it wrecked me, uh, and I still pay for it today. I wouldn't play the sports. <laughs> I mean, I played some tennis, but I would devote more time to doing that. Two more, two more questions. Uh, Dennis, how long, on average, does it take you to write a book? Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think everybody is is different in how long they take to write a book, but. My first book came out in 2010, and then my second one was 2018, so that's eight years. Um, and then my third book was in 2023, so that's five years. Of course, there's a pandemic in, in between, so you know, I, for me, the pandemic was an enforced writing retreat. It gave me a chance to really uh, focus on my writing every night. Um, so I'd say on average, <laughs> anywhere from five to eight years. Nonfiction is just about two years to do that for a 
Uh, I think my poetry book is a collection of poems I've been writing for 30 years. So uh, when that all you know, started to get curated and I really started to think about um, pressing that in one book, that took about two years. Wow, thank you. Last question. Okay. Do you believe in writing? Well, I, I know some people experience it. I never have, um, so I really don't believe in it. Um, but I, I think there's always things that a person can do to inspire themselves. Um, you know, I used to talk about in my class, even <coughs> riding the bus from Eugene to Springfield is a total inspiration in terms of, of writing. There's so many things you could do or just go out for a walk and you're inspired. Um, you can observe so much and, and document it and create a poem from it. So uh, fortunately, I haven't experienced writer's block. Well, I, I get stuck now and then. Um, I, I have a quick trick that I do. I grab a, one of those lines that I discarded from another poem. Sometimes I take uh, uh, one of my favorite poets' lines out of the poem, and I start with that. Then I write into it, and that usually takes care of it. If I can, if I can just get something in front of me, that then I can start pushing around, and then I eliminate that first line. I make sure that's gone. Uh, that's that's about what works for me. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Don't leave yet because there are books to buy, there's food to eat, there's company to have, and whoever fixed my um, bicycle. <laughs> Thank you so much.